May Day. What's up, y'all? Welcome to another edition of This Day in Boxing History. What day is it? May 1st. And today we're going to jump it off with some B Day shout outs. All right? Now, This Day in Boxing History, May 1st, 1887. Famous Philly promoter Herman Taylor was born. He was born in Philly and he died in Philly. Herman Muggsy Taylor. And he's generally considered Philadelphia's greatest boxing promoter ever. Hit me, hit me, hit me, hit me, hit me, you sucker. Taylor, like a lot of people, find found out that when he started boxing, that he was not cut out for it. And um, what's that famous uh crime boss in that movie? He boxed, he had a short career too. Uh, Mickey Cohen, same thing with him and, and tons of other people. Anyway, he had a, a record of 2-0, and then in 1912, he purchased the Broadway AC at 15th and Washington Avenue, and that began his long, illustrious 63-year career as a boxing promoter. In 1916, he teamed up with a dude named Gunness, Bobby Gunness, and they put together the Jack Dempsey Gene Tunney fight, which was in Philly. Now, his other notable fights he put together, um, promoter Herman Taylor, was Joe Lewis versus Galento, Ike Williams versus Bob Montgomery, one and two, Jersey Joe Walcott versus Ezra Charles Foe, Rocky Marciano versus Jersey Joe Walcott, Kid Gavilan versus Gil Turner, and a whole host of other fights. All right? Now, Taylor, he lost his license in the early 1960s because it was alleged that some of his matches were fixed. You know, go figure. But anywho, he later regained his license and he started promoting into his final promotion, which is in 1975. <clears throat> Taylor also promoted the first boxing show at the Spectrum in 1967 in Philly. And that um, premiered Joe Frazier whooping down a dude named Tony Doyle in the main event. And if y'all know anything about Philly, the Spectrum... After that, you know, later became you know, one of the most popular boxing venues during the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know. And I, I don't know if it's popular right now, but hopefully, like they did the Barclays in Brooklyn, they'll bring it back up, revive it, hook it up. Herman Taylor passed away in 1980. I'm giving a big shout out for all the contributions he did for boxing. All right. Next, born on this day, May 1st, in 1914, we have John Henry Lewis. John Henry Lewis was light heavyweight champion from 1935 to 1939. All right, and he was managed by a famous gambler, famous racketeer, Gus Greenlee. All right, Gus Greenlee had a lot to do. He, he was a black man, of course. He, would, he had a lot to do with um, the Negro Leagues in baseball. Y'all, I'm a real big fan of the Negro Leagues and the Negro League history. I just, I love the Negro Leagues. But anywho, this is boxing. Gus Greenlee had his hand in boxing, Negro Leagues. You know, he was about that money. He was about business. He was doing his thing. That was John Henry Lewis's manager. John Henry Lewis, Lewis passed away in Cali in 1974 at the age of 59, suffering from, you guessed it, complications of Parkinson's disease. And he was inducted into the Hall of Fame, International Hall of Fame, Boxing Hall of Fame, in 1994. And um, some notables on his resume. See Bob Olin, um, the Brown Bomber, Joe Lewis, James J. Braddock, and the list goes on. So, shout outs and happy B Day to John Henry Lewis and his surviving family. Mark, sucker. May Day, baby, 1960. Another birthday shout out Jose, aka Gabby Canizales, was born in Laredo County in Texas. All right, he turned pro in 1979. Dude had a seesaw type career. He's one of those cats that, you know, got a, a good amount of title fights and he will win it and defend it once and then lose it and then challenge for another title and then lose and then challenge for it again and then win and then lose on his next defense. So he had a seesaw type career. He challenged uh, Richie Sandoval, Raul Perez, Jeff Chandler, a lot of good bantam and um, featherweights during that era. All right, and he was the brother of a, of a of another bantamweight champion, Orlando Canizales, and both them brothers, both had world boxing championship titles in that weight class, WBO, WBA, and I think NBA. I'm not not quite sure, but they were the same age, so they might have been twins, or you know, one of them babies, some of them brothers that you know, or siblings that are eight nine months apart. You know, how people get down, but. 
Orlando and um, Jose Gaby Canizales, they have their own boxing gym and community center on, Guadal on Guadalupe Street in Laredo, Texas. So y'all check them out. And uh, uh, May Day again, here we go. Shout outs to Super Clinton Woods, a.k.a. Clint Woods. In 1972, May 1st, he was born. He stands, his record stands as 42 wins, 5 losses, 1 draw, 25 of those wins coming by Big KO. All right, now he's retired and he's from Sheffield, like your boy uh, Kel Brook. He was the former, um, Clinton Woods was the former IBF, European, um, and British light heavyweight champion. And he was also a Commonwealth champion at super middleweight for, for Britain. So, and, and on his resume, let's see, he has the likes of Ray Jones Jr., that's a big name, Glenn Johnson, Julio Gonzalez, Antonio Tarver, Tavoris Cloud. All right, so big shout outs, big um, big B day to him. May you see a million more. Next, big birthday shout out, May 1st, 1954. We got Mike Everett. All right, Mike Everett. I'm pretty sure he fought out of Philly as well, Philly Boxing School. Y'all, to me, you know, when we talk about Philly Boxing School, it's almost like it's like the American version of the Cuban Boxing School. You know, I mean, y'all know, y'all already know that I that I proclaim that the best boxers are from the South, but I, you know, I show a lot of love and respect in boxing in general, and this the Philly Boxing School has got the, the history, the prestige, and a lot of champions. But birthday shouts to Mike Everett. Um, Y'all might not know Mike Everett because he fought in the shadows of his big brother, the mean machine, Tyrone Everett. But uh, his his brother was up and coming, knocking dudes out real slick. They say he was real savvy, you know, kind of like a prima donna, uh, before his time type of fighter. But his brother, Tyrone Everett, transitioned early. He passed away early. You know, something crazy. His girlfriend shot him. Um, he was in there with some chick and some dude. You know, some something, something crazy. But his younger brother Mike, whose birthday is today, he was a good and solid amateur and pro. All right, and he had some decent fights with some decent dudes that I, that I don't really don't know, like uh, Norman Goins, Jorgen Hansen, Miguel Barreto, you know, a little before my time. But he challenged for a title at um at super lightweight, 140 super lightweight junior welter in 1977. All right. All right. 1902, May 1st, Harry Forbes decisions and whoops down Johnny Reagan in a 20-round bout in St. Louis, and he retains the bantamweight world title. All right? Now, Johnny Reagan, he was born in New York, and he passed away at the age of 35, but his, uh, his hometown was, uh, was in St. Louis, Mizzou. Born in New York, raised in St. Louis, Mizzou. His professional record, recorded record now, was 19, 14, 21, and won no contest. That means he has 19 wins, 14 losses, 21 draws, won no contest. And he had, uh, out of those 19 wins, 6 of them won by knockout. Now, this is the interesting dude right here, Johnny Reagan. Well, not really interesting, um, but um, you know what you got to make note of this. He was a self proclaimed champion. At 115 at bantamweight, so almost like the, like 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 the, like the word of mouth champion or or, or the or the town trash talking champion that really ain't the champion. Anyway, it looked as if he might have had the belt, but he never really defended it with a victory because he had two draws after this match. Anywho, after looking. And looking after the after his after his draw, it shows that Forbes, the guy that beat him on this day, fought or had the title and fought a dude named Young Devaney. So I know, excuse me, I don't know who had the title after their fight. Even though uh, Harry Forbes is in the books and he's on record for having the title in 1902, um, in in the month of January. But since your old boy Reagan 
was claiming he still had it. And Forbes, I went back and looked again, Forbes actually defended the bantamweight crown in his next bout. Even though the bout that Forbes and Reagan had together was a draw. See what I'm saying? So there was, it was almost like they was fighting for the crown. The dude was already claiming he had it before, Johnny Reagan. Then afterwards, Harry Forbes went and defended it, but Reagan was still talking trash, saying that he had it. Almost like the the, the same politics that, that went on with the um with the colored and the um black, you know, championships. But anywho, you look deeper, you look later on, and Forbes is fighting the bantamweight champion of England, which leads me to believe that he was the bantamweight champ of America, and they were probably trying to unify the world, those titles to make a world or intercontinental champion. You know, Reagan just putting on, you know, talking trash, bravado, young man. Y'all know how it is. Anywho, on to Harry Forbes. Now, Harry Forbes was called the scientific bantam. I know y'all think old school boxing is just some wild jokers with no teeth in their mouth and crazy looking mustaches and, excuse me, iron wheels and, and you know, uh, little pants, long pants on with belts and tight pants and stiff movements, but you're sadly mistaken, all right? Now, Harry Forbes was called the Scientific Bantam. He was from Rockford, Illinois, and he lived in Chicago, the Windy City. He was born in 1879 and he passed away in 1946 at the age of 67. Now I'm going to read y'all verbatim a newspaper article entitled Boxers Today Not As Good. And this article was published in November, in November of 1911 and it came out of the Tacoma Daily News. I think it's Tacoma, Washington, but I'm not sure. But the article reads this, quote, the boxers today do not know how to fight, says Forbes. In the old days, when the bell clanged for the beginning of the bout, the boxers did not get together like a couple of engines in a head-on collision. They sparred around a bit and tried to figure out the other fellow. When they saw opening, they led. They didn't rush into clinches and try to cave in the other fellow's ribs with inside elbows or try to crack his neck with smashes to the base of his brain. That isn't fighting. The fighter today believes that endurance is the thing. He studies and hardens himself for the purpose of being able to take a beating and be classed as a good, game, willing fellow. The old fighter was a boxer who seldom wanted a punch. He studied generalship and the art of landing punches that would prove effective. A fighter trained in the old days to be able to land effectively from any angle. And when they did, when they did, they hit. Every blow carried a sting with it. The wearing of bandages is a latter day trick. I seldom wore them. When I did, it was only the time that I ever hurt my hands. So he's saying, Forbes is saying that when he did wear bandages, i.e. wraps, that's the only time he ever hurt his hands. Back to the article. The present day fighter resorts to bandages because he thinks the chance of injuring his hands are lessened when he cracks an opponent with a misdirected punch on the head or elbow. But that's just where the fighter is wrong. Bandages are of little or no use. When they are put on, they fit snugly. As the fight progresses, they tighten up and the fighter finds it impossible to close his fist tightly. Then when he lands a punch, it's with a half closed fist and the result is the dislocated joint or broken hand. The bandages do not add to the power of a punch unless they are built of concrete or some other hard material." End quote. And that was by Harry Forbes. Harry Forbes uh, said that in a newspaper Tacoma wrote it down and that was in 1911. Alright, so put that in your pipe and smoke it. This day in boxing history, May 1st, 1914, Harry the Black Panther wills decisions. Another late, legendary great, Sam Langford in the 10 round bout in the NOLA, y'all. New Orleans, Louisiana. Few side notes here. Langford defends his world colored heavyweight title claim. His world colored heavyweight title claim in this bout. And pardon me, I said, um, Harry Wills' decision, Sam Langford, on this day, May 1st in 1914, but it was a draw. So part of me, it was a draw. Nobody won. And then six months later after that fight, 
Sam Langford KO'd Wills. And then they went on to fight each other over 15 times in each other's career. Wills won a handful. Langford won a handful. But majority of their bouts were no decisions, i.e. draws. All right? And they both KO'd each other. Langford KOing Wills more than Wills KO Langford. All right? So Harry... Harry Wills, Harry the Black Panther Wills. His record stands at 79 wins, 10 losses, and 4 draws. 54 of those wins came by knockout, and 19, he had 19 newspaper decisions. Now, I know we spoke about this before, but y'all, all these 19 newspaper decisions, some may already be counted in his wins and losses. All right? And newspaper decisions don't mean that you got a decision win. It just means that there's 19 bouts that the newspaper said that maybe you won, maybe you lost, maybe you had a draw, maybe you got knocked out, maybe your corner man messed up, maybe the referee, we don't agree with the referee. And sometimes they account for some of those newspaper wins in the record. Sometimes they don't. So, you know. But on the wheels, y'all. Harry Wills was a heavyweight boxer. And he was a three-time world-colored heavyweight champion. Now, many boxing historians consider Harry Wills the worst victim of the quote-unquote color line. And uh, all the color line means is, you know, fighters in certain eras would draw the color line. It usually wasn't black, but it was usually white fighters that would draw the color line against, we know, against black fighters. And I'm just assuming maybe Hispanic and Asian as well, you know, fighters with melanin. But historians say that Wills was the worst victim of this color line, especially in the heavyweight division. Uh, but I would argue Langford, you know, had a just as bad or worse. Burley, um, Jeanette, George Jixon. Um, but, you know, all that's up for debate. Now, Wills was born in the Nola, y'all. The Nolia. And he fought for over 20 years, from 1911 to 1932. And he was ranked as the number one challenger for the throne. You know, a handful of those years. But he was always denied the opportunity to fight for the title. Now, Wills fought many of the top heavyweights of his era. And he spent six years alone trying to get a damn fight with Jack Dempsey. And in this era where a lot, a lot of times the belt wasn't on the line, you know, but your name and your reputation was on the line. And if you fought somebody once and it was a good fight, you know... People were probably going to want to see that shit at least five, six, seven more times. So dudes knew what they were doing. Now, I don't think they were as scared or ducking like they do nowadays. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, that the fighters who claim not to want to fight black fighters or whatever fighter because of the, you know, the color of their skin, to me, they were scared and shook. But everyone else, I presume... Was, was already had a field schedule, had a field plate, and if they dodged a top contender, then one was right there waiting on them because there were so many top contenders, so many people willing to fight. I mean, there's only but so many people you can duck before you get called a punk and you can't walk around town. You know, wasn't no running back then. You was going to get that work, as they say. Yeah, but Wills, he defeated top contenders such as Willie Meehan, who went on to beat Jack Dempsey. He he beat um Gun, Gunboat Smith. Great day. Gunboat Smith. He beat him. He beat Charlie Wainhart. He fought Louis Furpo to a no decision. And these were the top contenders of, of his era. And he even faced the future heavyweight champion Jack Sharkey. But it was a disqualification during the bout. Alright. But then at the end of his road, he got knocked out by a top contender. Uh the name is here uh Paulino Uzkundan. And that signaled, you know, to him, and hey, it's time for me to hang it up. Now, in 2003, he was named to the Ring Magazine's list of top 100 greatest punchers of all time. All time, y'all. All right, y'all. So, again, the top black fighters of this era were usually forced to, to continuously fight each other over and over and over and over again because many white fighters said, I'm not having it. I'm not fighting those blacks, those darkies. They have powers. They look strange. I'm scared. It's a hazard. Um, I'm not used to it. I'm not risking it or whatever they were saying. But not all white fighters, but many white fighters of that day were, were saying that, especially the ones that were mediocre 
and all is good, you know, because if you were real good, you had a you had a rep to uphold. Now, as a result, Wills, you know, on this day, May first, nineteen fourteen, he fought Sam Langford. But as a result, because of this color line, it says right here, unofficially, they fought each other twenty two times, and Wills beat Langford. It says three times for the colored heavyweight title, and Langford won it back twice. Okay. Now, Wills also defeated another colored heavyweight champ, Sam McVeigh. And he also fought the Iron Man, Joe Jeanette, to a few no decision bouts. Now, again, on this color line thing, now we know there's color barriers and, and other crazy, you know, just hogwash reasons for not fighting black fighters. But what about the fighters that did? What about the fighters that, that wanted to be, you know, great or wanted to take that risk or that chance to be great? Without having that asterisk near their name, you know that the, the fighter. What about those fighters that want to challenge themselves? That want to face their fears against all opponents. See, I respect uh, Jack Dempsey, but to me, he, he's always going to have that asterisk near his name because he wouldn't fight black fighters, calling them monkeys, all this foolishness. He's tough and he's rough, but to me, if you keep, don't fight everybody, especially someone just because someone. Pigmentation is a little darker to you. I mean, I did. You got to ask for it. You got to ask for it. Now, I'm going to have to do more research to make sure this is true, but I'm pretty sure that Dempsey was not trying to fight nobody with any shades darker than him. All right. Wills retired from boxing in 1932. He ran a successful real estate business in Harlem, New York. You know, Harlem was booming in the 30s. He started running one in the in the thirties, you know, the Renaissance, all that good stuff. He was known for a yearly fast. I thought this was interesting, and he fasted once a year, y'all, for a whole month. Now, one just a full fast. In case you don't know what a fast is, is when you restrict yourself from a certain item, certain food, or water, or both, kind of like Lent. But during this fast for a whole month, he will only drink water for a whole month, just water. 30 days, just water, y'all. No food, no candy, no honey. And maybe it was Ramadan or something else spiritual. I don't know. But I had to put that in there because y'all think these people in these areas were silly and primitive. I know that's what y'all think. But they just as, just as advanced or most likely more advanced than your ass. They more advanced than you with your cell phone, pill popping. All right, next, next. Uh, in the same day that, that um, the man that uh, Harry Woods had a draw with was Sam E. Langford. He was born in 1883 and he passed in 1956. He was a black Canadian boxer, y'all. Um, boxing beats and rhymes shouts him out a lot. And, um, man, what, there's, there's just so much to say. There's so much to say about Sam Langford. But, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll just go down the list. Sam Linkford is called the greatest, quote, the greatest fighter nobody knows by ESPN. And he's ranked by the Ring Magazine, y'all, as the number two out of the 100 greatest punchers of all time. Number two greatest punchers of all time. I mean, somebody that'll punch your lights out, that'll end your life, that'll rearrange your jaw. He's number two on that list. And um, he was known, his nicknames were the Boston Bone Crusher the Boston Terror but his most infamous nickname which we all know or are finding out now is the Boston Tar Baby and Langford fought everywhere from I want to say from lightweight to heavyweight but it might be welterweight to heavyweight but just for the sake of his greatness we'll say everywhere from lightweight to heavyweight and at the prime of his career he was 185 and of course lightweight is 135 so bada bang <laughs> <laughs> Langford only stood at five foot seven, y'all. That's amazing. And we all know, or just finding out, that Langford was denied a shot at many world championships due to the color bar. And even Jack Johnson, the first black world recognized heavyweight champion, refused to fight with uh, Sam Langford. All right. Now Sam Langford was the world colored heavyweight champion, and that was a title that Jack Johnson had vacated before he won the world championship before Jack Johnson won the world championship 
And um, Sam Langford won the World Club Heavyweight Championship a record five times. And many, you know, historians and people that research boxing and all that good stuff, they consider Sam Langford the greatest boxer never to win a world title and one of the greatest boxers in history. Langford is ranked in the top 10 heavyweights of all time. He's also ranked in the top 10 pound for pound fighters all time, pound for pound fighters all time. And he is touted as the greatest Canadian fighter of all time. All right, and it says right here, okay, we were right, y'all. Langford is ranked at every weight class from lightweight to heavyweight. So in case y'all don't know, that's lightweight, welterweight, middleweight, light heavyweight, and heavyweight. The dude was beating top dudes and facing the top dudes at all those weight classes. That's incredible. And um, there's, there's a story here about uh, Barbados Joe Walcott fighting Sam Langford for the World Welterweight Championship. It, it probably was the color, but it just says World Welterweight Championship because it was in 1904. But they fought in 1904 in New Hampshire. And both fighters weighed in at 142. Five pounds below the welterweight limit. So that means they was ready to BAM. But here's what the um what the caption says. It says the fight resulted in a draw by decision. Thus Walcott retained his title. However, reports say that Langford clearly outpointed the champion. Langford kept Walcott at a distance with his longer reach and used his footwork to evade all of Walcott's attacks. Langford landed lefts and rights to the jaw so effectively that Walcott was bleeding by round two and he continued bleeding throughout every round. Walcott was even brought to one knee in the third round, and the fight ended with hardly a scratch on Langford. All right, y'all, there's just too many other great things to say about Langford. We're going to do a profile on him later. Next, this day in boxing history, May 1st, 1933. Kid Chocolate defeats Johnny Farr in Philly, Delphia, and he retains the super featherweight title. <laughs> Hailing from Cuba. <laughs> Them brothers stay with the conkling, boo. But yeah, Kid Chocolate, a.k.a. Sardinas, a.k.a. birth name Eligio or Eligio Montalvo. Brother has some juice. In this bout on this day, May 1st, 1933, Kid Chocolate, the original Kid Chocolate, I might add, he knocked down Johnny Farr four times in this bout and... Point blank, he's just one of the greatest featherweights in boxing history. Now, we've already done three-fourths of, um, of a profile on Kid Chocolate and on his country, native land, Cuba. And as a matter of fact, he will be our first profile on boxers. So expect that to drop sometime later this year. It's Black Al. On to Johnny Farr. All right, Johnny Farr, the man who, who lost the um, superweight excuse me, super featherweight world title battle on this day. His birth name was Johnny Farinacci. And we've already talked about the gains and changes and reasons for why immigrants mask their identity, why they uh, change their name to become Americanized for better opportunities, etc., etc. Now, his record stands as 46 wins, 48 losses, and 14 draws with 4 KOs and 12 newspaper decisions. Dang, that record is rough. So obviously he's a rugged, ragged, raggedy journeyman from Cleveland, Ohio. And in his defense of being a bum, he has many notables on his resume. He got Peter Cerrone on his resume, um, Barney Ross, Benny Bass, Kid Chocolate, Tony Conzaneri, Freddie Miller, and most of those men that we just named now have over 100 wins. And, and by the way, shout outs to DeLand, y'all. I got a homegirl from there, DeLand. Shout out to Cleveland, Ohio. Now, they say the Midwest has the best boxing and, and that the Midwest produces the best or has historically produced the best boxes in America. But I contend, I proclaim and I have other videos saying that it's the South who has the best boxers in America. All right, 1957, y'all. May Day, May 1st. The late, legendary great Sugar Ray Robinson. K.O.'s. Another late great Gene Fulmer. 
<clears throat> excuse me, and he wins the middleweight title for the fourth time. Sugar Robertson won it five times. This is the fourth time he won it. And in this fight, Sugar Robertson knocks out Gene Fulman with the infamous left hook, the punch that became known as the perfect punch. Burt Sugar once said in one of his interviews that when you look in a boxing encyclopedia, or at least the ones around his era, and you look up the term left hook, the picture showed is the picture of Sugar Ray Robinson KO and Gene Fulmer with a left hook on this day from this fight, 1957, May 1st. All right. So it, obviously it's this, it must be the number one left hook in boxing history. But we got a profile also coming up for the late great Sugar Ray Robinson and also uh, rest in peace to the recently dearly departed Gene Fulmer, a rough, tough Mormon from Utah. Uh, he held the world middleweight championship a few times, and he passed away recently on uh, April 27th in 2015. And he compiled a record of 55 wins, six losses, and three um, draws with 24 KOs. All right, next, this day in boxing history, 1959, May 1st, we got Floyd, Patterson, K. Owen, Brian London. In Indianapolis, Indy, y'all, and he retains undisputed world heavyweight title. Now, Floyd Patterson, a.k.a. the Gentleman Boxer, a.k.a. the Gentleman of Boxing, was born in 1935, January 4th, and he passed away in 2006. Now, we all know that at the age of 21, Floyd Patterson became the youngest man to win the world heavyweight title. All right? And he had a record of 55 wins, Eight losses, one draw, and 40 of those wins come up by Big KO. Now, he also won a gold medal at the 1952 um, Helsinki Olympics at middleweight. And he was 17 when he won that gold medal. Now, we know that Mike Tyson eventually came along and beat the, um, the record for the youngest champ ever, heavyweight champ ever, at the age of 18. But Patterson, when he did it, he was the youngest undisputed champ. When he won the title at 21, Mike Tyson wasn't the undisputed champ at 18, but he was still nonetheless the champ. All right? Now, everybody knows that Patterson was trained by the late, great Customato. Customato, man. He knew how, how to pick him out. The man was just a real coach, teacher, trainer, parent, guardian, um, you know, guru, master type of guy. And big shout-outs to Customato and the great things he did for boxing. Uh, Floyd Patterson, he was born in Waco, North Kakalaki, North Shari, and he's the youngest sibling out of 11. And you know, it goes on to say that he experiences a troubled childhood, you know, he was into bad things. His parents moved into Brooklyn, he got into thievery and theft. So his parents enrolled him at New Paltz High School. And to this day, New Paltz football field is named in his honor. New Paltz High School or school for, for boys. I can't remember which one it was. Football field is named Floyd Patterson football field in his honor. And this is when um, um coach, trainer, custom model discovered him at the at his famous Gramercy gym. You know, he got into school and he started to do better. And Floyd Patterson later goes on to say that this experience changed his life. When his parents enrolled him in this school and custom model saw him at the gym, you know, blah, 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 yakety smackety. Now, later on in his career, custom model went on to train a famous Canadian heavyweight, <clears throat> Donovan Razor Rudd, a dude who used to give Mike Tyson hell in the ring. He also trained his, um, his adopted son, Tracy Harris Patterson, who was a world champion level boxer. And I think he won one of the alphabet belts back in the 90s. I'm not quite sure. But uh, rest in peace to the gentleman boxer Floyd Patterson. We definitely got to do something for him as well. A lot of these fighters. And I don't want to make this video too long. So I'm kind of just, you know, rambling through, rushing through a lot of the info. But on this resume, man, you got all the greats. You know, Floyd Patterson, he fought Liston, Ali, uh, Archie Moe, Maxim, Jimmy Ellis. The list goes on. Patterson tried a little bit of acting. He starred in the episode of um, some cowboy show, some Wild West cowboy show. Here are a few of his quotes. Quote, it's easy to do anything in victory. It's in defeat that a man reveals himself. End quote. Here's another one of Patterson's quotes. Quote, 
They said I was the fighter who always got knocked down the most, but I also got up the most, end quote. And that quote was used in, um, in a TV series back in 09, by the way. Tons more we can say about Patterson. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, we'll say that for a later date. All right, on to the dude that he beat on this day, Brian London. Brian Sidney Harper London. He's from West Hartlepool, somewhere in England. And, of course, he was a heavyweight. He was a British and common, Commonwealth heavyweight champion. Uh, and he challenged for the world heavyweight title twice. Once he lost to Floyd Patterson, and another time he lost to Muhammad Ali. Now, he, he has a pretty good resume. He looks like a bum, in my opinion. But the dude was up there in title contention. He fought Henry Cooper, another good British dude. Dick Richardson, another good British dude. Zora Foley. Willie Pastrano, who was once the light heavyweight undisputed champion, um, Billy Walker, Joe Erskine, McNeely, um, Ali, Floyd Patterson, uh, and so right here, some you, some dude named Young Jack Johnson. Now, this trips me out. Now, there we go with people using someone else's moniker to help promote yourself, to help promote yourself great. And I mean, I don't know how I really feel about that, but personally, I can see you using someone's training methods. I can see you wearing someone else's lucky chain. I can see you eating the same foods that someone else is, is, is eating. But just jacking their whole name. You know, I mean, I, different mind state, different era. And then they probably have more love, you know, for the sport back then. You know, who knows? But can y'all imagine 10 years from now, somebody coming out with the name Young Hopkins? Or somebody coming out with the name Young Hopkins? Uh, young Oscar De La Hoya. Alright, but London had a title fight versus Floyd. He got KO'd there. Went back to England. Did his little British Commonwealth thing. Fought, you know, Dick Richardson, Cooper. And he came back 66. He got his second title titles, um, championship bout with Ali. And it is said that in his bout with Ali, Muhammad Ali landed 11 consecutive punches on Brian London. In three seconds, eleven punches within three seconds, and KO'd London in the third round. London said at that fight, "quote He was just getting through all the time." End quote. That fight was televised on BBC, y'all, the world-renowned, famous BBC TV in Britain. And O'Brien London's still alive to this day. He's eighty years old. Y'all give him a shout out. You know, especially you Brit British folk out there. If you're in Britain, give him a shout out. And he said of himself that he knew he wasn't a great fighter, but he knew he was really very fit. He knew he was greatly fit and in his shape. And I think he has something to do with that over in England, something to do with um fitness and all that good stuff. All right. This day in boxing history, May 1st, 1964, Stanley Kitten Howard stops. A very interesting boxer, in my opinion, Curtis Cox in Philadelphia, PA. All right now, y'all, I don't want this video to get too long, so I'm going to kind of run through this real quick. Um, Curtis Cox was an undisputed uh, welterweight world champion for about two and a half years, two, yeah, maybe a little bit over two, almost three years, but his record stood at 62, 14, and 4 with 30 KOs. Now, Curtis Cox is from Dallas, Texas. You know, he went up and down, up and down, Undisputed champ, um, Nate Fleischer, um, judge some of his the the famous Nate Fleischer with the um, with the Ring Magazine and the Box Encyclopedia, judged a few of his bouts, but he he lost his his undisputed title to a very another very very famous undisputed, um, welterweight champion, the legendary Jose Napoles. You know, a Mexican fighter that I think is either him or Sugar Ray Robinson has the longest undisputed welterweight um, title reign but um, Jose Napoles knocked out Curtis Cox two times um, he did his thing you know and then uh, Cox did, appeared on TV in 1972 and he got to see himself inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame and thank goodness he got to see himself inducted and appreciated while he was still alive now Curtis Cox right at the, at the moment he's 77 years old and he turned 78 on the 15th of next month in June. So y'all give him a shout out online. If y'all down there at the gym and down there in Dallas, Dallas, Texas, Dallas, Tejas, you know, show some love.
All right. Now, the man that beat him on this illustrious day was Stanley Kitten Hayward. And he had a short career, 32, 12, and 4 with 18 KOs. Nickname kind of trips me out. You know, I'd rather his nickname be Cat Hayward. But Kitten, you know, maybe, who knows, maybe some uh, innuendo going on behind that inside joke. Don't know all these nicknames come about. You just never know. Something comes up. Comes <laughs> something comes up out the blue. Like that scene in uh in Django. You never know how these how these folks get a nickname. Maybe one day he was cold, so they called him Eskimo. <laughs> yeah, but um, <clears throat> the Philadelphia. He's a Philadelphia legend, and he's in the Philadelphia Hall of Fame. Kitten Hayward has beaten such greats on his resume, such as um Emil Griffin, Curtis Cox. Um, who else has he beaten? Um, Benny Briscoe. And there's a lot to say about him. Um, he was just as famous outside of the ring, they say Kitten Hayward was, Stanley Kitten Hayward, as he was in the ring. He, he had a short role in, um, in the Denzel Washington, Tom Hanks film, Philadelphia. They say he's, dre he's always dressing fly. He was in the judicial system. Um, he, comes, he goes to a lot of the big fights in Philadelphia and, um, and in Atlantic City. You know, he comes to, I mean, he, he's just one of those standout dudes, man. He did his boxing career and he went and did well for himself afterwards. Thank God he wasn't broke and being ran after and back snapping and Parkinson's. And I love I love their stories like that. All right, 1983, May 1st, this day in boxing history, Edwin Rosario defeats Jose Luis Ramirez in Puerto Rico. Ho! Oh! And he wins the um the vacant WBC lightweight title. And check this out. The the caption for this fight reads, <coughs> and, and it must have been a pissed off cornerman or coach or parent or somebody. Um, and I and I didn't see this fight. It, it, it may have been a robbery. It, it, it may have not have been. But the note suggests that. Well, here here this is what the caption reads. Quote: Had this fight been scheduled for 15 rounds, Rosario well, would have been me. End quote. Now, nobody wants to hear that. If Hagler would have had 15 rounds, I think Sugar Ray Leonard would have been meat. If Mike Tyson, Jack Dempsey would have had longer counts or, or the rounds are longer. I, I, don't, I don't like to hear stuff like that. And and I've said stuff like that before, you know, as a coach. But like this fight that's going to happen tomorrow night, hook or crook, I expect the judges to be judging fair. But other than that, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear nothing about glove size. I don't want to hear nothing about who should have trained. The trainer's reflexes slowing down. Um, people in the crowd should have, would have, could have. Somebody else should have been brought in. I don't want. We don't want to hear it. No excuses, and no if ands or buts. No no weight cutting excuses. Blood excuses. So, and these because these men know what they're doing, y'all, and they know what they can handle. And they put themselves in these situations. Granted, they may feel forced to because of the fans or whatever other reasons. But they signed a dotted line. They drew their line in the dirt. And like I always shout, like the famous Rollo Jenkins video that I love so much, real men do real things. So we can't wait to see history here, Lamar Knight. This day in boxing history, May 1st, 1998, Cha Chai Sasaku KOs Young Soon Chang in Bangkok, Thailand and retains the WBC flyweight title. Sucker, you ain't nothing. Now, Cha Cha Sasaku was born in um, 1970 in February, and he was a, a well known boxing champion out of Asia in the flyweight division. All right? Now, he likes to do things like play snooker or snooker, and it's a game similar to pool or billards, but there's different rules, more balls on the table. Y'all look it up. But um, he captured the WBC and lineal flyweight titles in 97. Um, and he only got to defend them two times before losing them to Manny Pacquiao by a knockout in 1998. And that was Pacquiao's first championship title. Now, in 2007, Sasaku knocked out a Filipino man named Lito Cisnorio. And Cisnorio went on the dock due to head trauma at the hospital later on after that fight. Then come to find out, the Filipino commission didn't sanction Cisnorio to be able to fight um, Sasaku. So, after that happened, um, the board, the Filipino Boxing Commission or whatever, their, their governing body said that there's a ban 
that no Filipino boxers are allowed to fight in Thailand as of April 2007. So, so as we can see, them Filipinos don't they don't play with their boxers. All right. Now I hate that many many immature ones uh, got to resort to name calling and silly shit here online, but we can say that about a whole host of group of fans. Now Sasaku um, challenged um, a, a good contender at that time in 08, Mihares, Kristen Mihares, for the WBA and WBC Unified Flyweight Championship, but he got whooped down. He could barely see after the match, and then he finally said, you know what, I, I think I need to end my career. And I don't blame you, man. Your health is your wealth. You're not really known internationally on the international stage like that. Mm. Go home, raise your kids, enjoy the fruits of your labor, make love to your woman, all that good stuff. Sasuku had a uh, he had a real bright amateur career. It says here he was at the Seoul Olympics. He won the King's Cup. Y'all, the King's Cup is a real big tournament over there in um, Thailand, Philippines, somewhere in Southeast Asia. Uh, he took silver and gold at the Asian Games in the 80s. Anywho. His career record was 65 and 4 with 40 KOs. Now the dude he knocked out on this day in boxing history, Young Soon Chang, which if you know anything about Korea, his name is properly pronounced Chang Young Soon. And he has a record of 21 and 4 with 14 KOs from Seoul Hong Gook, baby, aka South Korea. And here I noticed again the, the infamous KO Spirit Destroyer, y'all. I know we talked about it a lot. The the, the KO just is so devastating. Y'all can understand if you've ever been knocked. Now I've never been knocked out by a punch, but I've been choked out. And I it's not as bad. Now I've been hit hard, I've been wobbled, and we've all been, you know, maybe knocked out something somewhere in some fashion. But for some reason, pro boxers it's so difficult for them to bounce back after a KO loss. Because they build up their morale, their spirit up so high. They build up their ego. They train for years on, on years on years, endless training. And I guess this to get knocked out is just so, it, it, it's so hurtful in many ways. Anyway, after Chong got knocked out, he had one more fight. And then he retired. And I guess he just wanted to prove after getting KO'd, like, you know what, I'm worthy again. You know, he got his mental right just to get back in the ring. He had to get his ego right. Even though his last bout, he lost by decision, he just wanted to say, you know what, I ended it on my feet. I got back up, I tried again. Can't end my career on a knockout, even though many fighters do. Now, I want to say something, man. It's hard as hell for us. It's difficult for us to find a lot of the Asian fighters, specifically Korean fighters. It's, it's real difficult to find their pictures and info about them. Now, Japanese, Thailand, and now Philippines because of the post Pac-Man era, it's easier, easier for us to find pictures and websites about them. But Korean? All right, but the only picture we, we got to hear of Chong is um, Chong Young soon is him fighting this Thai brother right here. So shout outs to Han Gook, Sarang Hei Han Gook. I used to live there. On to the next thing. All right. Now the final two combatants I wanted to talk about, which I wanted to tie everything in here, but with this video, with a little something, something, is, uh, let's see. Well, this, the first to say, this day in box history, May 1st, um, fight dates and superstition, y'all. Now, I got a question for you. Is there significance in choosing a fight date? Does it matter if you fight on the same dates? If so, why? If not, then that's cool, too. I suppose that the people who don't do that, they hold true that their will, their determination will help them prevail on any date, at any time, anywhere in the world. They 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 under the impression that they create their own luck. But check this out. The fighter, Taiwanese fighter, Verapool Sahapron, he fought on May 1st, not once, not twice, but three times. Not only three times. But three times, three years in a row. So we know those are all on different days of the week. Three years in a row. Tic-tac-toe. Johnny got hit by a UFO. Y'all know the songs, but um, Verapool Sahaprom, he fought on May 1st, three years in a row. And he won all three. And one of them, he won by KO. 
Now, is that coincidence? Luck? Fate? Good timing by the promoter? Was it chance? Or was it well calculated? Was it a superstition thing or some sort of magic or some type of special alignment? Now, I'll leave that for y'all to decide and get your, um, you know, let your, let your mind gear start churning. But Verapool saw a problem, a.k.a. the death mask, because he really changed his facial expressions, even when he was punching. He was born Verapool Samranklang, and his record was 66-4-2 with 47 KOs. And he actually must have been pretty decent because he had two very highly renowned belts. I think two of the oldest belts. He had the WBA and WBC world titles at bantamweight. He also had the Asian bantamweight title. And he had the WBC international super flyweight title. You know what? And, and all, all those are major belts. I was about to talk trash, you know, because a lot of, for some reason, a lot of Asian fighters don't get as much exposure. Or maybe, you know, they don't venture out that, that far outside of Asia. Uh, not all the time, but, you know, as of now, as of late, you know, the only really big ones I know is Donaire, Pacquiao, and there's a few other ones in smaller weight classes that they're, they're usually Japanese as well, too. But, um, oh, yeah, Verapool was all, also a kickboxing champion. But anyway, here are the stats for his bouts on May 1st. 2002, May 1st, Verapool saw prone wins by decision and retains the WC Bentonweight title. 2003, May 1st, he wins in Bangkok, retains the WC Bentonweight title. 2004, May 1st, he KOs a, a cat in Thailand and retains the WC Bentonweight title. Now, now here's where I, where I tie it all in, getting all conspiracy theory gears turning. In 2010, May 1st, May Day, Floyd Mayweather defeats Sugar Shane Mosley in Las Vegas. Now, I just want to say and tie all this in. So I'll go look at you. Since we on the eve of the big fight, now is this skillful planning of money made to want to fight in or around early May to keep something going, you know? Yeah, now, I'm also insinuating he is, but I'm not sure. Ever since he beat De La Hoya on that famous Cinco de Mayo um, back in, what was that, 2005, 2006 maybe, he, he has monopolized early May. As a matter of fact, he, he's fought on every date in early May except for one special date that we're going to name. He's fought, on, he's fought on one on May 1st. May 3rd, May 4th, and May 5th. Now, is this luck, superstition, smart game planning, precise measuring, or is it all chance? Is it just coincidence? By the way, I'm, I'm going to do a profile on, on Money Mayweather and Sugar Shane. I'm going to have to open up a new channel and center, center my focus on certain things. Y'all know how it is. But um, he went on all the early May dates except May 2nd. You know, and he always plans. He always has big fights in May. Now, granted, I know that's a business move, but is is it also precise calculation? Anywho, shout outs to this day in boxing history: May Day, May Day, May First. We love boxing. Peace.